Everybody heard that? Yes. The Church on a Mission. Now, Acts is one of my favorite books because it talks about the mission of the church, which basically is what is our mission because we are the church. So when someone asks me, Pastor, what is God's plan for my life? The Great Commission. What is it that God wants me to do? The Great Commission. So no one should be confused what's the will of God in their life is to reach out to people that don't know the Lord. How many have family members and friends and co-workers that are lost? Today is Sunday. Many of them had a hangover from Saturday. They still haven't woken up yet. How many know that feeling? You know, woke up at 12, 1, 2. You know, so we all have family members and friends that are lost. So the book of Acts gives us a blueprint on how to reach our family members and friends and co-workers. That's because that's what the church is all about. I thank God that I'm saved, that I received Christ when I was 18 years old, but there's other people that I know that are lost in darkness. So I just want to read the passage first, and then we're going to take our principles from that passage. How can we become a missional church? So Acts chapter 1, verse 1, starting at verse 1, it says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates that the Father has set by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. So the first thing we have to learn about the book of Acts is that the point number one, the book of Acts shows what Jesus continues to do and teach by the Holy Spirit through his church. So the first book that Luke wrote was the Gospel of Luke. The second book is Acts, which is a continuation. He tells in verse 1, my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Now in this book, he's going to talk about what Jesus continues to do and teach. How does he continue to do that if Jesus is not here physically? Through the church. Everything that God does, he does through his local church. The Great Commission cannot be fulfilled if it's for the local church. Everything that God does, he continues his work through the local church. And we have to realize that because sometimes we're praying for our family members and friends to get saved, but we don't witness to them. We're not around them. We don't put ourselves in a position where God can use us. We can pray all day, but unless we're with people, interacting with them, we're never going to reach them. God is not supernaturally going to save them. He needs the church, the body of Christ. That's the way God intended it. And we're going to see how the, the early church started and then how they take the gospel all the way to the Roman Empire. The capital of the city at that time was the Roman Empire. So the first thing we need to realize, yes, we can pray for people to get saved, but God is going to use us. Don't look for anybody else. You're the answer. If you're a Christian, you're the answer. So if you're not, if you're praying for people and you're not around people, you're, you're almost casting your prayer. So if I pray, God, use me to reach the lost, but I'm never with the lost. Is that prayer effective? No. No. God, use me to reach our family members and friends. Help me encourage brothers and sisters, but I'm never with brothers and sisters. Is that prayer effective? I like what C.A. Studd said one time. He said, sometimes the church 
uses prayer to hide behind the real work, right? We can pray, it gives us the illusion that we're actually doing something, we're interceding, God saved this person, all that. Then we go home, what's for dinner, watch TV, how's the game going? We don't interact with family members, people that are lost, and we just wait for next Sunday. If God is going to, if we're going to be a missional church, you are the answer. Amen. Everyone is here because somebody in human form spoke to you about the gospel. How many here had an angel appear to you and tell you you need to be saved? No, very rarely. It's another body, another human being that opened his mouth and told you Jesus loves you. God has a plan for your life. So we see that Luke talks about what Jesus be, uh, began to do and teach in the book of Acts. He continues to do and teach. How many of that? Jesus continues to save people. Jesus continues to heal. Jesus continues to move in a powerful way, but he does that through the local body. We are the answer to that. Number two, to be a church on mission, we must live with the reality of Christ's resurrection. Look at what verse three says. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Again, number two, to be a church on a mission, we must live with the reality of Christ's resurrection. He gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. Now, the New Testament records 10 different resurrection appearances to people. Now, convincing proofs means decisive proof. Sure signs, unmistakable evidence that he was alive. Positive proof and appearances went on for 40 days. Why did Jesus appear to the apostles for 40 days? Making sure that they knew that he was alive. Because without Christ, there is no Christianity. How many know that? Without Christ, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without Christ, where there's no hope. So Jesus wanted them to make sure that if they're going to be preaching this gospel. They needed to know that they're preaching a risen Christ that is alive and well and still heals and still forgives and still delivers. He wanted them to make sure they couldn't have any doubt that maybe he rose from the dead. Or I thought I saw him. It had to be a reality that this man who claimed to be the son of God is alive. And if we're going to be an effective witness and a missional church, we need to have a revelation of that, that Jesus is alive in our lives. And people need to see that, the resurrection power oh, wow. transforming our lives. Wow. And when they see that, they realize, wait a minute, I was a mess myself. Wow. How can I be set free? Yeah. You have something that I don't have. I was an alcoholic before. How can I be set free? I was addicted to pornography. How can I be set free? But you, we need to be walking in that reality that Jesus is alive. Yeah. And many times Christians walk around like Jesus is still dead. Mm -hmm. And woe is me. It's so hard to be a Christian. Please, God, come back soon. I can't take it no more. That's a defeated church. You know, God does not want us to be surviving. He wants a church that is thriving, winning souls, making disciples, letting people know that Jesus is alive, sharing the testimony of what God has done in your life. How many know the reality that Jesus is alive? How many know that for sure? That Jesus said, out of your heart shall flow rivers of living water that confirms that there's something on the inside of me that brings transformation and change. All of a sudden, you begin to love what you hate, and you hate what you once loved. No religion can do that. No signing your name on a church membership can do that. Only the power of the Holy Spirit that comes inside a human being, and now they are transformed by the power of God. And when we get on Sunday here to worship God, you know what we're celebrating? The resurrection of the Lord. Amen. Every Sunday should be a celebration. It's not a time to be dragging in and I barely made it. Or I was hanging in there. I'm talking about Christians that have been saved for a long time. If you're a new believer, you will have struggles and you're learning how to do this thing right. We've all been there. But if you've been saved for a long time, you should walk in there with a joyful song in your heart, ready to praise the Lord. You should be able to say like the psalmist, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. One day in your presence is better than a thousand. But if people don't see the resurrected Christ alive in you, you're not going to be an effective witness. They got to see that you're victorious over sin. 
Don't tell people God can set you free from lust and pornography and sexual addiction if you're still bound. Don't tell people that God can set you free from anger and bitterness and hatred. Meanwhile, you still harbor hatred and bitterness and anger. Jesus has to be real to you first. The resurrection power has to have an effect in you first before you can import it to somebody else. So we need to realize that. Is Jesus alive in, in your heart? Do you live with that reality that he has risen? Right now we're here, but the presence of Jesus is here by the Holy Spirit. How many sense his presence? He's alive. There's an anointing, which means the power of the Holy Spirit. He's here with us. We're not alone. I live with that reality every single day. Not only in this building, but when I go to work, when I go home, he's always with me all the way to the end of the age. Gee, many convincing proofs. Because if there is no resurrection, listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we are of all people the most to be pitied. And if there's no resurrection, we're still in our sins. And if there's no resurrection, let us eat and drink for tomorrow, we die. In other words, let's go all out. If there's no resurrection, if we're still in our sins, what are we doing here? Everything hinges on the resurrection of Christ. Every other religion, their leader is dead. Buddha is dead. Muhammad is dead. All these other religions, you go to their grave, you visit them. You go to Jerusalem, he is not here. He has risen. Amen. Jesus is alive. So without Christ, there is no Christianity. Amen. And number three, to be a church on a mission, we cannot get distracted with other things. Look at verse six. The, the apostles told Acts Jesus this. So when they met together, they ask him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. So the apostles will say, Lord, is it now that you're going to give the Jewish nation rule now? You're going to restore our kingdom all over again. And he told them, it is not for you to know those times or dates that God the Father has set. In, in nicer words, he said, that is none of your business. Be focused on what I've called you to do. And we as a church can de get distracted with minor things, things that are peripheral, things that don't matter. If Satan can keep the church distracted with other things, you know, sometimes even with ministry, as long as it's not sharing the gospel with our friends and neighbors and coworkers, for them to get saved, he'll keep the church busy with programs and the church doing more ministry for more members of the church. That's it. And there's no outlet to reach out to the community. And if we don't evangelize, we'll end up fossilizing. If we don't become a movement of, of soul winners, we become a monument. And many churches have become monuments. All they talk about is the good old days, how God used to move and people used to get saved. And we've been doing it like this for 30 years. And they don't want to change. They don't want to reach out to the community. They become a museum or a monument, something that you visit and talk about the good old days. But God has left that place a long time ago because God is always involved in the church in mission. That is the whole purpose. Christ died on the cross to save the lost. Jesus said this, the son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost. So what should the church be doing? Seeking and saving that which is lost. There is no other plan. There is no other goal. There is no other purpose. There is no other mission. That's it. We get together to celebrate the resurrection of Christ, to learn the word of God, to go out there and do the work. That's why we're saved. So don't get distracted with other things. Focus on family members that you've been praying for. Call them. Witness to them. And if you have not ready, just pray for them and wait for an open door. Friends that you know that are lost. Because some people, I was talking to a young woman yesterday, and, you know, she's hungry to be witnessing and sharing her faith and all that. So don't make the mistake to cut all your friends off that don't know the Lord. Christians do that, and now they don't have no unsafe friends. The worst mistake you can make. Because now you're hanging out with salt all the time. Hanging out with believers, you lose your influence. Right, So they say that a new believer is good for two years because they're so connected with all these unbelievers. After two years, all they have is Christian friends. They become a society within themselves. And they don't talk to non-believers or non-Christians or anything like that. That's not good because we're called to reach out to those in our community, to those who don't know the Lord. 
So don't get distracted. Number four, the church, to be a church on mission, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. To be a church on mission, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit's power, we cannot accomplish this tremendous task. It's a huge task. How many know that there's so many people lost? So many sins, so many addictions, so many mental health problems, so many things going on out there that if we don't have the power of the Holy Spirit to bring them the gospel, we're not going to be able to do it. In verse 8, he tells them, but... Don't worry about the times and seasons that the Father has set. But, and again, that word but means on the contrary. Instead of focusing on when I'm going to restore the kingdom to Israel, this is what you should be focusing on. Don't worry about God's program. God is going to have his program. God is going to have his way. God's will is going to be done. But you, the apostles, you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in order to reach people. Because like Wayne was saying, we, nobody can change another human being. How many times we've tried changing somebody else or even changing yourself? And you say, you know what? This is the last time I'm going to do this. I'm tired of this. No more. You'll last a week or two. And next thing you know, Go right back into it. New Year's comes. They make New Year's resolution. I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to live right. I'm not going to do this anymore. Before you know it, they're doing it again. Why? Because Jesus said, he who commits sin is a slave to sin, which means they can't stop even if they want to stop. They need a greater power than themselves. Paul the apostle explained that we are all under the power of sin. I like the way he uses that phrase, under the power of sin. How many know that sin is power? That you say, let me just try this once. And before you know it, it enslaves you. Like they say, first the man takes the, the drink, and after that, the drink takes the man. You lose control immediately. You start sinning, it becomes a power, and you can't stop even if you want to, unless there's a greater power than sin intervenes in your life and that is the lord jesus christ only he can set an, an addict free an alcoholic you know whatever the, the issue is only he can set people free from sin there's no other remedy in the world to set people free from sin so we see we need the power of the holy spirit and jesus told him, wait in jerusalem wait for this power and already they were already saved they were walking with him for three years and a half but he was talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit was going to come upon them and enable them. That word power in the Greek means ability. You shall receive supernatural ability that you didn't have before to be a witness for me. You can't witness on your own. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. And the way you get that is by living a life of prayer, by living a life in the word. You can go to Bible college you know, for four years and even go to seminary and still be dead spiritually. Because God only gives his anointing and power and filling of the Holy Spirit to those who spend quality time in prayer. Those who are with him in the secret place of the Most High. Those who go into the, the prayer room and seek God. That's where he pours out his power. We can't do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to realize that. So we all need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. After conversion, it is a subsequent experience or a different experience. Everyone who received Christ into their life you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. But here he's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which the Holy Spirit immerses himself on you, he comes on you to minister. So when you get saved, the Holy Spirit is living inside of you for salvation. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not for salvation. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for empowerment to do the work of God. How I many you know we need power to do the work of God? Why? Because people are exhausting, right? If you sit around listening to people's problems all day and you don't pray or read the Bible, you'll end up in a mental institute. Listen to because people are, have problems, right? So you need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to be able to deal with people, to be able to encourage them, to be able to help them, to be able to share with them scripture, what God is saying so that they can be edified and built up. And then number five, to be a mission, a church on mission, we need to start with our own community. He said, you're going to be witnesses, but 
in Jerusalem, and then Judea, and then Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So you start with your own community, people that you know that are lost, co-workers, people that you see in the store. When you go shopping, they might look down or depressed or they're having problems. You know, and a lot of people, most people have relational problems. That's why when I was young, I started reading books on relationships, even though I was not in a relationship. I just wanted God when I first got saved as a teenager. But everyone I talk to always end up talking to me about their boyfriend or their girlfriend. How do I get over this or that? I say, wait a minute, this is a big thing in life. Let me learn a little bit about this so I can bring the gospel to them. Because everyone you know wants to be in a relationship, was in a relationship, or is in a relationship. And most of their life is caught around that, relationships. So we start with our own community, people that you know. And you'll be surprised how people open up to you. You know, they start talking and tell their whole life story. You know, I drive a bus, I dropped off a kid, a woman just opened up to us, you know, I've gone through divorce, this and that, for like 15 minutes. So not even driving a bus and going on a nice ride, you can relax. Because people are so hurting and, and, and burned inside that you just need someone to talk to, someone to open up. There's so many opportunities out there to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we start with our own community, with our own people, and then in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And I'm always amazed how people want to go on missionary journeys to go bring the gospel to another country, but they don't share their faith with their neighbors and their own community. If, you, if it doesn't work at home first, you can't export it anywhere else. We start with our own community. You pray, God, begin to use me. You got to be around people, you know, and build bridges, you know, to, to meet people and constantly be sharing the gospel. Because if not, all you're going to do is be around Christians. And that is not good as a believer because there's others that need the gospel. That's why God, you know, showed me, stop teaching. I was teaching like three times a week, you know, different classes and all that. I got to get back to evangelism because if not, all we're doing is teaching and teaching and teaching and people are getting fed and fed and fed and fed. Guess what they become? They're spiritually obese and no one wants to do anything. No one wants to evangelize. No one wants to give out tracts. No one wants to witness or make disciples. It's great to learn the word of God, but for what? to go out and make disciples of all nations. So if you've been saved for a long time, ask yourself this question. Who have you won to Christ since you've been saved? How many people you brought to the church, to the Lord? Who are you discipling right now? That is the bottom line. Not whether I can preach up here on Sunday and everybody's impressed or whatever the case may be. is Who am I pouring into right now? Who am I discipling? Who am I taking under my wing? And I love my father-in-law's memorial service because so many people came up to share how he has impacted their life. And there were so many people that could have shared, but the reason he was able to impact their life is because he had to get close to them. Right? Did he build relationship with these people that shared? Or he did it from afar? Oh, he was a good guy. He sat in the back and never talked to anybody. Was that the testimony? The testimony was right. He was there. We felt them. We saw him. We saw Christ incarnate in him. He affected my life. We need to be around people, church. You know, especially unbelievers. Make those connections. And that's when true discipleship takes place. Being around people that you can pour your life into is great receiving from the Lord. But it's better to give that out, especially if you've been saved for a long time. Now, if you just got saved and committed your life to Christ, learn the word of God. Share your testimony with people. And a lot of times that I've experienced, those that just got saved are the ones that want to tell everybody about Christ. And the person that's been saved for five or ten years, I don't know, they might get offended. And, you know, I'm shy. I don't know how they're taking and all that. But that same person in the world used to get drunk and wild out. Right? They never, oh, people are looking at me, none of that. That we don't even want to talk about the things that happened, right? When they got drunk or high or whatever. But now we come to Christ and I don't want to share with them about Christ because they might get offended, I might lose a friend. Listen, you're sharing with them the greatest news in the world. Amen. And you're sharing it with them out of love. You're not trying to get people to join a church. You're trying to get people to be saved because you love them, because they're lost, and Christ died for their sins. And you're letting them know you don't have to live this way. 
I thank God that a 14 year old had the boldness to share with me the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there were churches in every corner in Brooklyn. I don't know if you've been to Brooklyn or the Bronx. There's churches all over the place. But there's only like 10 people in those churches. Why? Because they don't evangelize. They're not missionary. You know what's keeping those churches going? A meeting, AA meeting, the yoga class on Monday, all these different things. Big, big, big buildings, but empty inside. And the world is, is paying the light bill and all these different things. Because we stop evangelizing. So we start with our own community. Just like my father-in-law. You impact people. You have to get close. Will you get hurt? Most likely. How many know that? Was Jesus hurt many times? Did he get betrayed? Did his, even his family told him, go get him. He's crazy. Get him out of that house. He's been preaching too long. And they went to get him out of a house. Your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. He said, my mother and brothers are those who do the will of God and obey him. I'm not going out there. I'm not a kid anymore, basically. He was telling me. I'm doing the will of the Father. You see? So we need to do the will of God. So we start in our own community. And number six, to be a church on mission, we can't be idle waiting for Christ's return. Verse 9 says this, and as he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, Jesus. And a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going. When suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him, two angels. And he told men of Galilee. Now remember, they were all from Galilee. That's north of Jerusalem. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. In other words, then Jesus told you to go into Jerusalem and wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What are you guys doing staring into heaven, being idle? And a lot of times the church throughout the history has rapture fever. They're reading all these books on rapture. I can't wait for Jesus to come back. And you heard Revelation. This means this. And the signs and the times, all these different things. And they don't witness to anybody. So basically, the angels were telling them, get to work. What are you doing here staring into the sky? Being idle. You know, and my cousin was talking to me earlier about uh, First Thessalonians. that she was reading that, it says, if a man doesn't work, neither shall he eat. Because at that time, they said, Jesus is coming back soon, but by work. But they were eating for free. So he was saying, the other members of the church, don't feed them. They're freeloading. If they don't work, they shouldn't be eating. They have two legs. They can work. But the whole background there is that they believe that Jesus is coming back soon, so let's just hang out and eat until he returns. We're not working. We're not doing anything. So we can't be idle as a church if we're going to be missionary. We need to be on the move. When Jesus comes back, whether today or 20 years from now, nobody knows the day or the time. But I know what he's called me and you to do, and that is to make disciples of all nations, to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Everyone has that calling. And I love, again, I bring up my father-in-law because he was not a pastor. He was not an evangelist. He was not a prophet. He was not an apostle. He was not a teacher. He was just a regular member in the church that caught the vision that the only reason he's here is to share the gospel with other people. If we had members just like that, forget, forget about pastors and evangelists, just members like that, that, that catch that vision, Lord, use me all the days of my life. And I like when Mike Lamada was doing a Uber, you know, bringing people here and there and share the faith with them when they're in the car. You know, and now he does Zoom meetings with, with AA meeting. And he's there because God has him there to share with those people that Jesus is the way when he gets the opportunity. So even in your home, there's still ways to share the gospel, especially in the social media, you know, world that we live in. And God has made it so easy for us. But a lot of times we're so full of excuses instead of commitments. There's so many people lost. So he doesn't want us to be idle. And just, man, if only Jesus comes back right now. We're praying for the rapture. You know, I'm having a hard time. And all these different things when there's people that are lost. That is the greatest thing in the world. Seeing a sinner come to Christ. Seeing someone that's lost become found. That's why Jesus said there is more joy in the presence of the angels in heaven. When one sinner repents, then over 99 who need no repentance is the greatest joy in heaven and the greatest joy in my life, too, as I witness people coming to Christ and God transforming their lives. So, church of God, 
wants to use us, but we need to be committed to the Great Commission. There's nothing else to do, really, in the church. A lot of people want positions or this or that. There's really nothing else to do but to win souls and make disciples. We have the first principles. That whole first principles, level one, is to make disciples. Then we have level two, and then level three. And after that, we have other classes. So you'll always be learning for the purpose of making disciples. So whatever you learn, you pass on to others. Pour your life unto others. What do you want others to say in your funeral? He was a good brother, or she was a good sister. Or they impacted my life. They called me when I was down. They prayed with me. They met with me in Dunkin' Donuts when I was having a hard time. They brought me through. You know, they taught me how to pray. You know, they fasted with me. I didn't know anything about the Bible. They volunteered to teach me the Bible verse by verse. You're impacting people's lives. That takes time, which people don't want to give up. People will come on Sunday and worship and yell and scream. But to take time out of their schedule to point to somebody else, that's when true discipleship takes place. Jesus said this, by this the world will know that you are my disciples if you bear much fruit. A disciple bears fruit. So the question that I ask again to you, have you been bearing fruit in your own life? Because that's how you measure everything. Is there fruit in your life? Or are you just getting fed and learning and learning and learning, but there's no fruit in your life? Is there anybody that can vouch for you and say, you know what, if it wasn't for this person, I would not be here right now. The Lord has used them tremendously. That's impacting people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I love what John Maxwell said. He said, we can impress people from afar, but we can only impact them up close. We have to make a decision. Do we want to impress people or do we want to impact people's lives for the glory of God? That they change. Now, you might not be winning souls and, and doing all this, but you can disciple people. And pour into them, pour your life into them, especially if you've been saved for a while. You learn all that, but it's for a reason you're learning all that. It's to make disciples. So in summary, there is only one central application to this passage. The church is called to engage in the mission to this world through the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that Jesus Christ is going to return. So what is the purpose of the church? To go into all the world and make disciples. What is the women's group all about? To train them, to disciple them, they're getting healed, they're getting restored, they're being loved on. To do what? To go out and get other women that are broken, that are hurting. What is the men's group all about? To get together, talk about men issues, help them get delivered from certain things that they're struggling with, pray with them, encourage them, lift them up, and all that. So what? They can go out and look for other men that are hurting and broken and dying. Everything that we do, everything, every ministry, that is only a means to the end to go out and get more people that are in the same situation that you were in. And people that have been saved for a long time forget that they were lost one time and they become pharisaical. I mean, like the Pharisees, you know, judging everybody, being critical of everybody. Why are they doing this? Why they don't remember how they were when they were lost. Ask the Lord, God, give me a flashback to not me how it was when I was lost. And the Lord will show you, and you will start having a burden for the things of God. Charles Spurgeon said this, if you don't desire others to be saved, you will not save yourself. Be sure of that. Now, that's a strong statement. If you don't desire others to be saved, you're not saved yourself. Be sure of that. Now, it's a little extreme, but I know what he's trying to say. That if you are a Christian and you don't want anybody else to experience the joy, the love, the forgiveness of sins, the shame being removed out of your life, the guilt, the, the burden of sin, all that's been taken out of your life, and you don't want somebody else to experience that, you got to question your own salvation. Because when you experience that, you want everybody to experience forgiveness of sins. You know how many people are carrying around with the load of guilt and shame because of things they've done in the past? Or things that happened to them as a child that they carry that huge load, you know, like a burden in their heart. And only Jesus can alleviate that. But we got to present people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're going to grow church, but we're going to grow if everyone is involved in the mission of the church. It's always in every, every church, two or three people that bring new people. 
that witness, that evangelized. Everybody else is hanging out, worshiping. I remember when I got saved, they used to have soaking meetings. Soaking meetings is that you soak in the presence of the Lord for hours. That is, that's wonderful. But then you go out and go home and watch TV. And then you know, the neighbor next door is on his way to hell addicted to cocaine and you don't share the gospel with them. What good is it if we have soaking meetings and you don't share that with somebody else? That look, that you want to come and soak too? The presence of God is for everybody. You know, so all these different means that they had, and we don't want to just create programs to keep Christians happy, you know, and entertaining them. We want to create ministries that would empower, that would equip people to do the work of the ministry, to reach out for more and more women and, and, and men, and even our teenagers, you know, saying, Kathy, we need to pray. We need like a youth pastor to come with a burden for the youth. I don't know how people can be saved and not have a burden for people to be saved and to be transformed. I have so much vision, so many things that I want to do that I'll probably never get to do it. But I don't know, someone can pray for hours and hours and God never tells them to do anything. It's either that or extreme disobedience. And a lot of times it's not ignorance, it's disobedience, right? I know some people here that know so much of the Bible, you can go to another country and save that nation all by yourself. Sharing with them the gospel. No, you got so much Bible. But it's not ignorance. It's disobedience. It's not my calling. I'm not an evangelist. That's not what I do and all that. And again, I go back to my father-in-law because he is the model of a regular church member. That's it. A regular church member that caught the vision that life as a Christian is always for somebody else. For you to bless somebody else. What God does for you. Share that with somebody else because we can become self-centered in the body of Christ, but he wants us to be Christ-centered and present the gospel to other people. Why don't we stand as we get ready to close? And if you're here this morning and you want to commit your life to Christ, you heard the message, but you've never committed your life to Christ, we want to pray for you. And as you commit your life to Christ, God's going to change you. God's going to transform you. He's going to do great things in your life. God is an awesome God. I've been serving him for 20 something years, and I never look back and say I was better hanging out with the devil. Never. You know, so what God does for you, you share that with somebody else. So if you want to get committed to Christ, commit your life right now, right there where you're seated. And I'm going to close in prayer, and then you can come up, and I want to pray for you. And we're going to pray together, and you get committed to Christ, and you're going to start a brand new life. Your whole life is going to change. So just in your heart, just, just pray this prayer together and uh, agree in this prayer. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that your word, oh God, Lord, teaches us, Lord, that you want us, oh God, to be missional, Lord, that you want us, oh God, to be evangelistic, oh God. Father, your word says, oh God, to go into all the world, oh God, and make disciples, oh God, of all nations, Lord. Father, help us, oh God, obey the great commission, oh God, Lord. For many of us, oh God, Lord, it's not ignorance of the scriptures, oh God. It's just disobedience, God. And we're not comfortable doing that, oh God. We'd rather do something else. God, we pray that every member, oh God, in this body, Lord, would have, oh God, a burden for the lost, oh God, Lord. Give them creative ideas, oh God, to start new ministries, oh God, Lord, to reach out to the lost, oh God, Lord, as you gave me many years ago, Lord, with the great dancing ministry to reach out to the hip-hop culture, God. You got so many ideas, oh God, Father, I pray that you would give every member, oh God, different ideas, oh God, Lord, and how to reach the lost, oh God. How to reach their family members and friends, oh God, Father, our entire, oh God, body of believers, oh God, will participate in the mission of the church, oh God, that we would not be selfish, oh God, that we would not keep this great news to ourselves, oh God. Help us, oh God, Lord, empower us by the Holy Spirit, Lord, to accomplish the great commission, oh God, Lord, that we will leave that work to another brother or another sister, God, but that we will all take responsibility, oh God to inviting people to Christ, Lord, and bringing them, oh God, to church, Lord. Remove us, oh God, from our comfort zone, oh God. And that which we want to, we feel comfortable and easy to do, oh God. Help us, oh God, Lord. Be father like my father, Lord God, who, Lord, witnessed, oh God, to everyone he came in contact with, Lord, and spent time with people and poured into people. God, help us spend our lives, oh God ministering to other people, Lord God, that we will go from self-centeredness, oh God, Lord, to Christ 
centeredness, Lord Father. Help us, oh God, be that New Testament church, Lord, as we go through the book of Acts, oh God, Lord, and, and see, oh God, principles of how, oh God, the disciples in the early church, oh God, reached out to their communities, Lord, that we would apply those same principles, oh God, for your glory and honor, that we would also reach our community, Lord, in a loving and caring way, oh God, Father, that when we see the multitudes, we will be moved with compassion, Lord, in the name of Jesus, God, give everyone a burden, Lord, for the loss. In Jesus' name I pray. How many agree with that prayer? Amen. 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 God bless. I love you. If you want to come up for prayer, I'll be up here to pray with you. And you're dismissed at this time. And I ask you to take your fellowship if you're going to talk, you know, in the back. Because if people come receiving prayer, we don't want people talking or the chairs being removed at this time. Thank you. Amen.